bio readings are so embarrassing. <laughs> um, I just want to start by saying um, I didn't know what to expect by being here tonight. And um, I sat on the side with tears rolling down my face. Uh, and I think it's a testament to the fact that the spirit is here, yeah? Um, so thank you. Dr. Terrell, I just want to say to you, uh, it was a pleasure to hear you sing. Your work was influential in my own development. I read you as a seminary student to sing with Dr. Butler, who I'll be in conversation with. So it's really an honor to, to engage you live and in color. Um, <laughs> And I, no, I say that because often, I don't know if we, for, for many of us who are writers, who are thinkers, you don't know how far your work travels and where it will land. And your work helped me in a moment where I was struggling to find God, even amongst people who said they were helping us to think through God talk. Um, so, all right. I, I am honored to be here. And let me just give a caveat before I start, too. Um, Abolition as a frame is not just about thinking about how we can rework systems. It's also about how we can rework our, inter our relationality, our, re our ability to relate to one another. So with that in mind, I want to change this sort of lecture style a bit. I'll talk a bit, meditate, but I'm also going to invite you to do some talking as well. Is that okay? All right, so don't get scared when I start asking you questions. So let's get free case for an abolition theology. Let me just start also. Um, by thanking Dr. Stephen R. Gray and Kim Johnson, who have offered hospitality for making it possible for me to be here, so thank you all. And also Dr. Christopher Ringer, the Center for the Study of Black Faith and Life, and also uh, Tyler Tully, and a Resilience and Leadership Initiative who I had the pleasure of talking to today. All right. So I'm beginning my talk this evening by invoking two scenes the first of which is an account of home, and the second of which is a recounting of that which might be closer to home for many of us. I begin in Camden, New Jersey in the early to mid 80s. Scene one. The small living room, our tiny kitchen, our modest bedroom would be saturated by a booming noise, often a grunt emanating from my father's heavy voice. Somewhere between, between the timber, I would discern a somber sigh, most likely that of my mama. Daddy used his fist to do what he had not yet learned to do with his mouth. The force of his punch was his grammar, the way he used his body to dissent, to persuade, to subjugate, to control, to respond to, to beat my mama were in many ways pedagogical. My daddy was what becomes of human persons socialized into manhood. Human persons who had been socialized to believe that their bodies are instruments of authority and weapons of destruction. I hated him because of it. I hated what he attempted to teach my mama, me, and my little sisters. I hated the lessons that he had regrettably been taught were true. I hated the smell that emanated from his body, which reeked of the dry and putrid air that had been sun-baked into his skin. After the many hours he would spend on the streets and not in our home, I hated the punches and the commands and the bravado and the looks and the one too many drinks with the homies on the corner. So I prayed more than once for God to intervene. When I wasn't praying for God to take him or take me and by take, I mean kill. I would pray for God to conspire with the police, who would in turn conspire with the courts, who would in turn conspire with the local corrections facilities where I had hoped my father would end up for good. I wanted him gone. But gone is too vague of a description, an effect of what I had prayed for with the fervent, earnest, and juvenile desire of a son who was too scared to sleep through an entire night out of fear that he would wake up to any given morning to start a day only to discover that his mama had been killed. I was too scared to wake up to utter silence. I really wanted him to stop beating my mama. I wanted my mama to be able to move about her day without having to monitor the tone of her voice or simmer down her attitude. I really wanted my daddy to lose himself in the big laughter that he was prone to release. 
I wanted hugs, not a body slammed. I wanted flirtatious banter, not demoralizing verbal invectives. I wanted my daddy Grafton, which was his given name, to be liberated from the grip of the persona, Sweet Daddy, which was a name given to him by those in the streets that others had celebrated him for portraying. But I was a kid. And gone was the easiest way to communicate what I desired he couldn't, but couldn't name. So I believe the fastest way to end the violence was by supplicating to God to be bodied forth in the form of law enforcement. I'm going somewhere with this. Looking back, I remember the ways my insides would quake when the police cars would pull up to my house. Y'all get that feeling? The noise and the lights of the siren blurring. How ironic a turn of emotion I would experience considering that my initial flights of terror, the reason my family members would call the police or the reason I would pray to God at all were replaced with yet another type of terror, the terror that surfaces and overtakes many black, Latinx, working poor, queer, and trans or undocumented people whenever we are confronted with the instruments of the state. I recall many days when the police would show up after having been summoned to intervene, the police who showed up tended to be men who seemed to be possessed of the same energy as the man they had shown up to control. <laughs> Daddy used his fist as did the police on occasion. I feared that they would end up beating my daddy who would end up in custody because he beat my mama. It was a masculinist game they played. But I didn't realize it because my immediate desire for daddy to be, to be gone was cloaked by my real desire for him to stop beating my mama, which I had prayed for God to actualize. I didn't make the connection then between my disparate views of God and justice, the state and injustice. In my spiritual imagination, it was not clear that the God who had been incarnate in the person of Jesus, whose death had come after an encounter with a different state apparatus, was being called upon as a source for state intervention. But this is what I believed. It was, to me, an easy resolve. Justice looked like daddy gone, when what I, when what I really wanted was an ending to the violence that daddy meted out. I really wanted my mama to be safe. I wanted happiness and peace. And it seemed logical that the quickest response to the bigger and more complex nuance, the, the more complex and nuanced um, problem of patriarchal rule, gender socialization, ideals of manhood ensconced in dominance and power, was to pray to a God who can be envisioned as warden, as an arbiter of a type of insular justice that only showed itself to be terrifying and violent. It is clear to me how now how my God images and my views of God were shaped in such a way that my theological imagination ended up with a view of justice that could be material, materialized in the form of a jail or prison cell, because that is and has been the American response to complex harms that beget harms. It is a result of having been preached to about a better and more just world to come in the hereafter, as opposed to being attuned to a God whose presence might be better understood as the spirit that compels us to build a transformative and just world, free from violent ways of being and relating, free from systems that dictate that we ought to solve, solve harm by doing harm, which shapes our theological imaginations in the present. Scene two. A few weeks ago, I was a guest speaker at a literary event in Dallas, Texas few minutes away from one of the locations where we were to be assembled for a pre-convening arts event was the home of the now deceased Botham Jean. As we drove through the neighborhood, my host called our attention to the left. This is where Botham Jean lived and was killed by that police officer, he said, with a tone signaling his exasperation. 26-year-old Botham Jean, unarmed and black, as you know, was at home likely comfortable and shielded from the horror that would soon overtake him on the evening of September 6, 2018. He was at home before Amber Geiger, a white Dallas Police Department patrol officer, entered his apartment, assuming it was her own, according to her, and shot and killed him. We drove through the neighborhood, which is now ghosted by his murder. We talked about his murder through a collective pain and rage that has become common. We, too, were black people who were overly cognizant about the precarity of our lives, 
overly shaken by the reality that we could also be at home or on the streets or at a march or at a church service unarmed and be struck down by the bullet fired from the gun of another who sees us as threats before we are seen as human. We too were black and knew that our deaths might be easily overlooked as a result of some police officers, our neighborhood watch person turned vigilantes dormant fear. We too were black and knew that another's irrational panic might be the cause for their impunity. We too were black driving through Botham Jean's neighborhood stuck between collective fatigue and heartbreak before Geiger was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 10 years in prison. After Geiger was sentenced on October 2nd, Botham Jean's younger brother, Brant, forgave and hugged Geiger. Jean's father, Bertram, also forgave Geiger. The judge, Tammy Kemp, a black woman, hugged and held and read over John 16, 316 with Geiger before giving Geiger her Bible. To many onlookers, especially black people, those acts amounted to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Yeah. Cheap grace, which according to Bonhoeffer means grace sold on the market like cheap Jack's wares. These are his words. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religions are thrown away at cut prices. That's his words. The displays of a too quick forgiveness, of a too quick embrace to many was not an example of what Bonhoeffer conversely named costly grace. Onlookers wanted justice a type of justice that often eludes black people within the US. We were left to ponder how cheap grace, the kind of grace that America expects of the marginalized to offer, even after we've been harmed, often comes as a demand for a too quick type of black forgiveness. So I understood the refusal of some to move on, to let go, to atone, and like so many others, we were left with questions. Writing in Religious News, a scholar of African-American religion, J. Cameron Carter opined, for example, quote, can there be a forgiveness that does not absolve guilt but brings the anti-black world to an end? Could there be a poetics of forgiveness that pressures forgiveness as we know it? Could there be a forgiveness that ends forgiveness? a forgiveness at the end of the world. And he ends by saying, let's hope so. But some of us pursued a different set of questions. Some of us questioned the questions. Some of us questioned the logics that lay just below our demands. Black queer writer Hari Ziyad posed, for example, the following meditation as part of a much longer and nuanced Facebook post slash sermon. Quote, so when I say we shouldn't be okay with Geiger going to prison, it has nothing to do with whether I empathize with her. And the argument doesn't require anyone empathize with her either. It only requires us to see the carceral state for what it is. The same thing that produced Geiger, the same thing that will continue to produce more Geigers, and the same thing that relies on our comfortability with or even cheering of it on the rare occasion that it eats one Geiger in between creating 500 more, the comfort is necessary for its existence. <laughs> Ziad offered a fiery word. But are they proffering an unrealistic and unattainable way forward? What is the it of which they said our comfort makes possible? Like Ziad, I refuse to downplay the optics of what was seen as a display of cheap grace, at least on the part of the judge. I've witnessed many displays of the too quick race to assuage a white police officer who murders a murdered a black person. I understand how and why black people would be provoked by those displays, so much so that they begin to question the emotional leaps black people are expected to meet to assuage white guilt. But what are we to think about the overall reliance on systems and institutions like jails and prisons whose very foundations are themselves built upon anti-blackness as tools for transformative justice? Could there be, as Carter names, a poetics of forgiveness that is organized around principles of costly grace, of people transformation, 
of the ending of harm that does not require the diminution of black suffering in an anti-black world? And could there be an ending to the uses of the systems that keep our anti-black world firmly in its place? Is justice just simply because it is calculated by what Sadia Hartman calls a racial calculus and political arithmetic that is computed according to carceral logics? So I want to pause here because I think we need to orient the ways we learn and build knowledges differently. And I want to ask you to speak to somebody. <sighs> Decenter yourself and my perspective. I want to give you an opportunity to speak to a conversation partner. And I want you to sort of respond to this question, and I'll give you three to five minutes. What are we to think about our overall reliance on systems and institutions like jails and prisons, whose very foundations are themselves built upon anti-blackness as tools for transformative justice. What are we to think about jails and prisons and law enforcement whose foundations are tethered to and built upon logics of anti-blackness as tools of social transformation? Another way to say that. How are we to name jails and prisons and law enforcement as just tools when they are doing unjust things in our communities? Can you turn to somebody you don't know and talk for about three to five minutes and then we're gonna return back? It's lovely to see you all engage. It's lovely to see y'all engage. And like you, I don't have solid answers, right? But I'm on a quest to find them by first posing a different set of postulations through which we might collectively struggle. And I hope we can struggle together tonight. So let me offer some thoughts on my understanding of abolition. Much of my thinking on abolition has been shaped by the intellectual and organizing efforts of black women, black feminists, like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, a formidable activist and scholar of geography. If you don't know her, please write her name down, go search her works and get it. As well as the work of Angela Davis. Ruth Wilson Gilmore in some defines abolition as a form of analysis, as an organizing practice that is not centered only on the removal of the systems that harm us. Get this. It is not centered only on a removal of the systems, the things that harm us, but the process of imagining into being the life and soul-affirming soul affirming tools that ought to go in the place of the things that harm us. It is the feeling, the feeling of the necessary void. It is a collective leap from the nadir. According to Wilson, quote, abolition is figuring out how to work with people to make something rather than figuring out how to erase something, end quote. Abolition, therefore, is ultimately a politics and a practice of creation, not just destruction. It demands that we broaden and diversify our imaginations to activate and stretch and complicate what historian Robin D.G. Kelly calls our freedom dream such that we might trade material, institutional, systemic, interpersonal, communal beauty for the many ashes late, left in the wake of slavery's afterlife. Yeah. Abolition is not a politics or practice of resignation, but a politics and practice of resistance, yeah. of struggle, of co-laboring. Abolition means, as Rachel Kushner describes in her compelling interview with Gilmore in a New York Times magazine, it is, quote, not just the closing of prisons, but the presence instead of vital systems of support that many communities lack. 
She goes on to say, instead of asking how, in a future without prisons, we will deal with so-called violent people. Abolitionists ask how we resolve inequalities and get people the resources they need long before the hypothetical moment, as Gilmore puts it, when they mess up, end quote. It is as Gilmore and her co-conspirator James Kilgore define it, quote, a practical program of change rooted in how people sustain and improve their lives, cobbling together insights and strategies from disparate connected struggles, end quote. And it comes from a desire to, quote, want a society that, that centers freedom and justice instead of profit and punishment, yeah. as Wilson and Gilmore explains. Abolitionism as a principle of social transformation, as a tool of world remaking, has its roots within a US context in the freedom struggles of those who sought to push back against the colonial sweep that disappeared indigenous nations and a human people trade that crisscrossed the Atlantic, turning the ocean into a commercial thoroughfare and African and people into and African people into things, objects that were commoditized and violently managed. Both Gilmore and Angela Davis, among many other scholars and activists who inspire us to take serious the need for an abolitionist practice, draw a genealogy of abolitionist thought and praxis back to the period of reconstruction within America as recorded and analyzed by W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois, Gilmore explains, quote, showed in black reconstruction in America that abolition is a fleshly and material presence of social life lived differently, end quote. Gilmore goes on to state that Du Bois shows in exhaustive detail how both slavery ended through the actions and organized activity of the slaves no less than a Union army. But also, since slavery ending one day doesn't tell you anything about the next day, Du Bois set out to show what the next day and days thereafter looked like during a revolutionary period of radical reconstruction. So abolition, Gilmore says, is a theory of change. It's a change, it's a theory of social life, it's about making things. Everybody say, making things. But let me take Gilmore's theorization a step further. Abolition is akin to what the late theorist Jose Muniz defined as queer. Not queer as in not heterosexual or non-heteronormative, though abolition is certainly that but queer as in radically politically visioning and a, a process of self-world remaking. Queer, in Munoz's estimation, is an optic through which we might imagine what he called the not yet here. It is that which we dream of and move toward in the hope that we might attain the substance of that which we desire. Abolition, as defined in key words for American cultural studies, quote, is talked about as the byword for finality, is at bottom the symbol for urgent democratic, social, and political change that has not yet occurred. Abolition, therefore, is queer, is imagination, is prophetic utterance. Abolition, therefore, is a practice of faith. We are sometimes called, y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are sometimes called to fight for the things that we might only vision and touch first in our collective imagination. Consider, for example, the history of the abolition of slavery, the period of reconstruction, the entrenched responses by the state and its white citizenry post-reconstruction, and the connections of all of the above to our present. Reflect on the following words from Angela Davis, from which I'm quoting extensively from the book Abolition Democracy, which you all should buy. This is Davis's words. Du Bois argued that the abolition of slavery was accomplished only in the negative sense. 
In order to achieve the comprehensive abolition of slavery after the institution was rendered illegal and black people were released from their chains, new institutions should have been created to incorporate black people into the social order. The idea that every former slave was supposed to receive 40 acres and a mule is sometimes mocked as an unsophisticated rumor that circulated among slaves. Actually, this notion originated in a military order that conferred abandoned Confederate lands to freed black people in some parts of the South. But the continued demand for land and the animals needed to work it reflected an understanding among former slaves that, listen, slavery could not be truly abolished until people were provided with the economic means for their subsistence. They also needed access to educational institutions and needed to claim voting and other political rights, a process that had begun but remained incomplete during the short period of radical reconstruction that ended in 1877. Du Bois thus argues that a host of democratic institutions are needed to fully achieve abolition, thus abolition democracy. What then, Davis asked, would it mean to abolish the death penalty? The problem is that most people assume that the only alternative to death is a life sentence without the possibility of parole. However, if we think about capital punishment, and I'm gonna add here all forms of carcerality and punishment, as an inheritance of slavery, its abolition would also involve the creation of those institutions about which Du Bois wrote. Institutions that still, somebody say still, still remain to be built 140 years after the end of slavery, end quote. In other words, to achieve a goal like the ending of capital punishment as one example, we would need to fully realize the very institutions, rights, access points to services and support that Du Bois and others surmise as necessary for the transformation of democracy 142 years ago. Or in different words, the project of slavery necessitated control, punishment, surveillance, death, confinement. Contemporary carceral apparatuses are rootly, deeply rooted in the same. And in lieu of creating the conditions and institutions and services and ways of life that could free us, the state responded by fortifying its carceral apparatuses. The state chose instead to create institutions and laws that would asphyxiate one's well-being or impact upon the choices she may make. This is what Eduardo Medianta, in conversation with Angela Davis in her book, Abolition Democracy, calls a crisis of imagination. So reimagine, if you will, how the full realization of those institutions would have shifted the ways we think about responding to the social conditions that ails us. Prisons and punishment are our default cheap responses. They are the result of lazy dreaming. Rachel Kushmer, writing in her feature on Gilmore, says, quote, you don't solve a problem with state violence or with personal violence. Instead, you change the conditions under which violence prevailed. Consider the fact that we are not yet there. Instead, we are living through the not yet fully realized manifestation of, I, of an ancestral people's abolitionist vision, a not yet fully realized freedom. But black people in the US are here nonetheless as a consequence of our ancestors' desires and undismayed work that have been centered on the replacing of the social order as they had experienced it with new forms of social relations, with new ways of being, with an abolitionist democracy, a freedom that we are yet fighting to fully actualize in our present. And quote, no one cherishes freedom more than those who have not had it. That's Nicole Hannah-Jones in her piece in the New York Times 1619 Project. She also went on to say, quote, and to this day, black Americans more than any other group embrace the democratic ideals of a common good. The truth is that as much democracy as this nation has today, it has been born of the black resistance. 
Our founding fathers may not have actually believed in the ideas they espoused, but black people did. I ain't hear enough amens. For generations, she says, we have believed in this country with a faith it did not deserve. Black people have seen the worst of America, yet somehow we still believe in its best. That's her words. But to believe in America's best is to believe in that which we have not yet attained. It is to resist the lure of lazy dreaming. It is to resist an empty poetics of democracy. Black people have long imagined that which is necessary to upset and replace the bad. We are living in the material reverberations of a people's collective faith. In a democracy whose poetic ideas the marginal life has struggled since the inception of this settler colonial nation to match with just materiality. Abolition is a faith practice. And that which results as the substantive consequences of a people's faith. But let me give you another opportunity to breathe. <laughs> Literally. Can we breathe in and out together? Breathe in. Breathe out. And I want to invite us as we're wrestling to, to be with one another. I'm going to ask you to respond to a different question this time. Are the systems and tools that we presently have access to, the systems and tools that we actually need to transform our people, our communities, our homes, our ways of relating, useful tools for transformative justice and healing? You sort of answered that one in the first round, but here's the one I want you to ponder on. In what ways do our theologies impact the ways we think that the non-useful tools are actually useful. Another way to say that, how are our theologies abetting the white supremacist cis-heteropatriarchal cis capitalism that undergirds our carceral apparatus? How is our theologies leading us to believe that somehow we will find fr freedom in cages? Find somebody that you didn't talk to before and talk to them. I'll give you about five minutes. This time. I would love even for us to think about how we can model discussions like this in the spaces that we occupy, whether that's the classroom, our worshiping spaces, or the street corner. Um, it's, it's beautiful to watch us um, engage and struggle together. Y'all good? OK. We've reflected on and talked about abolitionism, but what are we to make of what some might call an abolition theology? I should note that the first people I heard use the term were Patrice Cullors, one of the architects of the Black Lives Matter Global Network, and the Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson, former pastor of the St. John's Church and the current president of the Deaconess Foundation in St. Louis. This was after our Black Life Matters Freedom Ride in 2014. But the term, the rubric, abolitionist theology, was also in use by communities like the Community Church of Boston as early as 2009, and likely by many people earlier than that. Writing in the Harvard Law Review, Patrice defines abolition as a, quote, praxis that roots itself in the following principles. People's power, love, healing and transformative justice, black liberation, internationalism, anti-imperialism, dismantling structures, and practice, practice, practice. It is guided by political movement traditions against slavery and racism dating back to the African and the indigenous Maroons of the Americas who dared to imagine their lives without shackles, end quote. She went on to state that abolition finds new ways to operate within a society that considers its members disposable, which is a point that is critical for a framing of an abolition theology. An abolition theology requires a reliance on what scholar Brandon Daniels names an abolitionist imagination. Daniels compels us to think about how an abolitionist imagination 
allows us to, quote, risk radically reimagining theology and the good, and from there to creatively envision moral possibilities beyond, over, and against the prison and the logics and systems that govern and uphold it, end quote. But let's be honest and consider how our moral imaginations as progressive and expansive and righteous and just as we think they might be can also be confined within and chained to what bell hooks calls the white supremacist cis heteropatriarchal capitalism in other words it's impossible to radically reimagine theology when some of our freedom dreams are the stuff of other people's nightmares We can't possibly reimagine justice for the most vulnerable among us if we believe that God errs always on the side of those who are positioned within the nation state as having proximal access to power, whether they be heterosexual, cisgender, the rich, the state, white, able-bodied, or the so-called citizen. This is a nightmarish theology, and its articulations are not new. Theologians like James Cone, for example, have written as much when riffing on the symbolism of the cross, for instance, in the book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, Cohn offers this critique, quote, unfortunately, during the course of 2,000 years of Christian history, the symbol of salvation has been detached from any reference to the ongoing suffering and oppression of human beings, those whom Ignacio Alicuria, the Salvadoran martyr, called the crucified peoples of history. The cross has been transformed into a harmless, non-offensive ornament that Christians wear around their necks. Rather than reminding us of the cost of discipleship, it has become a form of cheap grace, there's that word. An easy way to salvation that doesn't force us to confront the power of Christ's message and mission until we can see the cross and the lynching tree together, until we can identify Christ with a re-crucified black body hanging from a lynching tree, there can be no genuine understanding of Christian identity in America and no deliverance from the brutal legacy of slavery and white supremacy, end quote. An abolitionist theology would indeed allow us to make the symbiotic connection between the cross and the lynching tree and the jail and the electric chair, and the gas chamber, and Abu Ghraib, and empire. An abolitionist theology, therefore, requires a work of raising the, sac the secure walls that cage our imaginations. Because when we set our imaginations free, we will ultimately obliterate the fortifications that have confined God in our imaginaries as nothing more than an agopic, hawkish, hawkish militarist. Second, an abolition theology is a speculative theology of hope in the not yet here, the not yet attained, the otherwise, as a Sean Crawley would name, the unalike, the expectant. Abolition, however, is not an end, or as a community church of Boston posits on his site, a simple, quote, eschatological moment. It is, as the writer goes on to express, quote, a reflection of our collective ontological selves. It is a movement built on hope, quote. It is the writer, as the writer explains, a liberationist, humanist theology of, libera of abolition that hopefully will fill some of the empty space left by the destruction of the prison industrial complex, end quote. But the goal is not the destruction of the prison industrial complex alone but the collective work of imagining what ought to fill in the necessary void left by a removal of the prison industrial complex and its contingent features. It is there for the work of repair. And let's be clear, the prison industrial complex is not only the collection of material structures built by the state or private corporations in which people are incarcerated. It is, not only the, it is not the only system in need of repair, no. It's grounded in a range of carceral ideologies that shape our imaginations too. In short, we can't demand the abolition of jails or prisons or the death penalty if we are not willing to abolish white supremacy, cis-heteropatriarchy, ableism, settler colonialism, 
capitalism, and any other feature of systemic oppression that form our ideological bars, which hold the prison industrial complex firmly together in the US and in the US, in the US, in us, in our imaginations. And finally, an abolition theology is a theology of reckoning. It demands of us to consider our complicities in and reliances on the very systems that ail us. It demands of us to acknowledge and deal with the crisis that is the limitations of our moral imaginations. It demands that we be honest about comfort, our comfort with the carceral state, which makes the carceral state possible and necessary. And because we are comfortable with easy disposability, it may, it may make all talk about abolitionism sound as if it is overwhelmingly foolish and unfeasible. But abolition is faith. Somebody say faith. faith. And abolition theology is a theology of the not yet here. It is an Afro-futurist theology. It is a queer theology. It is a liberation and womanist and muralista and disability liberation and trans and feminist theology. An abolition theology is an aspirational theology of repair. In closing, let me circle back to the beginning. I often wonder how my father's and mother's life outcomes would have been differently impacted had we had access to systems other than law enforcement in a criminal justice system. What, for example, would have been the difference if we had a safe number to call that would have prompted the arrival of accountability partners comprised of community and family members whose first priorities were my mother's safety and the ending of violence and whose secondary priorities were to provide a space outside our home where my father could go to receive interventions that help him de-escalate. Interventions that would have allowed him to journey to the source of his anger and violence. What, for example, would have been the difference if he had access to mental health support? Trainings, trainings that prompted examinations of the interconnections between masculinity, patriarchy, and violence. Work readiness support, our trainings on parenting. Consider that he became a father at 15 year, 15 year old. What, for example, would have been the difference if my prayers to God for my father to be gone were organized around an articulation of a vision of justice that did not overly demand enactments of violence to solve the problem of violence in which he enacted? What, for example, might justice look like for someone like Amber Geiger, a former agent of the state, if it was envisioned as a process of accountability that centered her reckoning with her actions and the logics of state violence that governed her actions? What if she had to return to the communities whose spirit she deadened, to labor, to face and sit with the tolls of state violence and to undo them, to be of service to the Gene family, to be transformed? What, for example, might justice look like if we had imagined it that which comes not by killing the problem, as Ruthie Wilson Gilmore suggests, but by naming and removal all the issues that make problems possible? What would justice and our world look like if God was imagined as the source of, and creation of an abolitionist democracy that is not yet realized but ours to build, a vision of transformation not yet actualized, a world that we have yet to behold, and how why, might we, you and I, be differently activated to achieve justice if the freedom dreams we conjured did not also function as the nightmarish artifacts of white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal capitalism and the prison industrial complex. What would it mean and look like if we all decided to get free by releasing ourselves from the grips of the strong hands which too many of us have grown comfortable having around our necks? The work of freedom begins today. Right now. With me, with us, and we have a choice to be resigned with what we have, are actively imagining into being 
and building future-oriented communities that the articulation of our wildest and most liberative freedom dreams cannot even match. Thank you so much. Yeah.